When you look at diagrams of bird topography, even nicely presented ones like those in your Peterson guide, it's easy to have flashbacks to biology exams and other things you might rather have avoided and would perhaps like to avoid in the future. Who wants to memorize a bunch of technical names? Shouldn't we just dive right in and enjoy the birds? Well, sure, you can do that, and you probably should. You don't need many words to enjoy the beauty of an indigo bunting. You don't need words at all, really. Just drink it in. But as you go forward in bird watching, it becomes awfully handy to have some more precise language to use in talking and thinking about the birds you're seeing and those you hope to see. The real payoff is that knowing more helps you see more, and to see more clearly. And the pleasure and excitement of seeing birds is the main reason most people start bird watching in the first place. So instead of looking at a chart and trying to sort out all those terms at once, let's take a look at a few actual birds and see what they might teach us about bird topography. Besides, you won't often see species that show nearly every field mark simultaneously, unless you specialize in lark sparrows. Adult Wilson's warblers are plain yellow below and a bit greener above. Their crowns are glossy black, except for a small yellow area just above the bill. You could say that they have a yellow forehead or fore crown. This area is also called the front in birds, as in greater white-fronted goose. Many birds show a contrasting eyebrow or supercilium, like the Carolina wren. The white-throated sparrow has a yellow spot in the forward part of the eyebrow. It also has a white central crown stripe. A line through the eye, rather than above it, is called simply an eye line. Eye lines have the effect of making the eyebrow more prominent, as in these nuthatches. The main difference in their face patterns is the presence or absence of a dark eye line, but what really jumps out at you is the white eyebrow of the red-breasted. You'll frequently see rings around the eyes of birds. Guess what they're called? Eye rings can be formed by contrastingly colored feathers or skin. The skin around birds' eyes is called the orbital ring. All birds have orbital rings, but in the vast majority of species, the skin color blends in with the surrounding feathers. Trogons and many gulls are notable exceptions. It's hard to overstate the importance of looking at the bills of birds especially their shapes. Color can help, too, with contrasting lower mandible patterns being identification clinchers in many cases. Northern shrike can be told from loggerhead shrike by its longer, more hooked bill and the pale base of its lower mandible. The rear part of a bird's head, between the crown and the back, is called the nape. Male bobolinks have a beautiful golden nape in their breeding plumage. When just the lower part of the nape is contrastingly colored, or when the color from a bird's underparts wraps up around its neck and across the nape, it's said to have a collar. The region below and behind a bird's eye is called the auricular because it conceals the ears. If you can't remember the word auricular, you can always use face. Northern weed ears have prominent black auriculars. Between the face and throat, there's an area called the malar. Markings there are called mustache stripes or whiskers. Just below a bird's bill is its chin. Below that is the throat. The black chin hummingbird is well named. Its chin is black. Its throat often looks blackish, but will flash purple in the right light. The backs of birds are rather high up. The gray-headed subspecies of dark-eyed junco has a reddish-brown back. Between the back and wings is an odd little patch of feathers called the scapulars. They often hang down and cover the wings a bit. Magpies have clean white scapulars, appearing as bright stripes between their dark wings and backs. The breast on a bird is not the entire underparts. It's the area below the throat and above the belly. Male green kingfishers have red bands across their breasts. Somewhat confusingly, Breast bands may also be referred to as collars. The term belly needs little explanation. The black phoebe has a white belly. The flanks are located on either side of the belly, below the wings. The tufted titmouse has rusty flanks. The rump is below the back and above the tail. 
Magnolia warblers have bright yellow rumps. The lowest feathers on the rump, just covering the base of the upper tail, are called upper tail coverts. These are blackish in the magnolia warbler. The underside of the tail is covered by the undertail coverts. The crystal thrasher has a reddish patch of color there. The wings and tail have large feathers that power and steer the flight of birds. They're collectively called the flight feathers. Tail feathers may be marked such that they form distinctive patterns when fanned and or when folded. White outer tail feathers are common. Sometimes the tail tip has a band of contrasting color. Wings can be thought of as similar to human arms. They have a hand, a wrist, and a forearm. The flight feathers that articulate from the hand are the primaries. Those from the forearm are the secondaries. In this northern gannet, the primaries are black and the secondaries are white. The secondaries closest to the body are often called the tertials. They can play a key role in the identification of a number of birds. These two woodpeckers demonstrate how the wings fold up when a bird perches. The white secondaries of the red-headed woodpecker sit atop the black primaries, which are longer and more pointed. In the white-headed woodpecker, the white bases to the primaries are visible just under the all-black secondaries when the bird is perched. The primary and secondary feathers are covered by, once again, coverts. Primary coverts and secondary coverts, respectively. When wing coverts are tipped in white or another contrasting color, they form curving lines across the folded wing called wing bars. This male rose-breasted grosbeak gives us a lot to work with in understanding flight feathers and their coverts. His primaries and most of the secondaries are black, though the tertials are tipped with white. He has a big white patch in the primary coverts. His secondary coverts are broadly tipped with white, creating white wing bars. His tail is black with white corners. The upper tail coverts are grayish, edged with white. We could keep going over the rest of his topography in excruciating detail, but we run the risk of losing the forest for the trees. After all, this is a male rose-breasted grosbeak, a most beautiful and interesting creature, and the study of bird topography is most valuable when it leads us to a greater understanding and appreciation of the birds themselves, not just of the arrangement of their feathers.